Hey guys, and welcome to Anchor to Truth. Tonight we are diving into chapter 18 in the book of Jubilees. So let's get started. All right, guys. Uh, just as a side note, you can also find this story in Genesis chapter 22, uh, verses 1 through 19. Mm -hmm. So let's start in chapter 18 of Jubilees. And it says, And Elohim said to him, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take thy beloved son, whom thou lovest, even Isaac, and go unto the high country, and offer him on one of the mountains, which I will point out unto thee. And he rose early in the morning, and saddled his donkey, and took his two young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood of the burnt offering, and he went to the place of, on the third day. And he saw the place afar off. And he came to a well, a well of water, and he said to his young men, Abide ye here. With the donkey, and I and the lad shall go yonder, and we have and when we have worship we shall come again to you. And he took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took his hand uh took in his hand the fire and the knife, and they went both of them together to the place. And Isaac said to his father, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said unto him, Behold, the fire and the knife and the wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Father. And he said, Elohim will provide for himself a sheep for a burnt offering, my son. And he drew near to the place of the of the mount of Elohim. Hmm. So in this, in the first verse, uh, there is a note right off the side here. And I think this is some really good stuff to point out. Um, that there is a reference that says... Uh, where I have it highlighted here, take thy, <clears throat> take thy beloved son. And, and the, it also says the same thing in the Septuagint, but in the Masoretic text that has been modified from the Septuagint, uh, it says only son. So where in, in Jubilees and in the Septuagint, it says, take thy beloved son in the Masoretic text, it says only son. Mm. So I think that's important. We can't forget that um, Ishmael was blessed also. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. And I think that that's one thing that um, that people like to, to forget about. It's a convenient thing to try to forget about. But that's not the case, that, uh, that Ishmael was blessed as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and something else, guys, I, I like to, um, while we're on the beginning of this chapter, right there in the footnote, it says, uh, it is God Himself who directly proves Abraham. You know, we we um we we had kind of correlated this story with the, the story of Job, or the adversary, or Mastema had come to the father and said, "Hey, you know about Job and all that stuff." And it was the adversary that actually went and tested Job. But in this, what we're seeing is the adversary has no hands on Abraham whatsoever. Right. It's the father himself who is actually giving the commands and telling him what to do. So. Kind of the same way, but in another way, not so much. Yeah, I like that um, when, when we're kind of looking through this story so far, it's really showing Abraham's obedience. It's showing Abraham's mm -hmm. willingness to listen. And I think, you know, sometimes we use that word Shema. Or we use that word, um, you know, to pray without ceasing or to really dig in and let the Father speak to us. It's like, you know, listen to that still small voice. Abraham seems to already have that line of communication open. He's prepared and ready, but not only ready, but he's ready to take action on whatever the father says. It's not like, oh, well, if God tells me to do this, you know, I'm going to have to go home and pray about it and get a second witness. Who's, second, who's Abraham's second witness? Where did Abraham stop and go to the mountain for 10 days and think about it? He's like, God said, do it. He said, yes, sir, I'm on the way. What do you need? What do you need? Wood, fire, knife, kid? All right, all this packed up. First thing in the morning, I'm out. If you need me to do anything else, I'm here. But, you know, we're going to, you know, as we read later on, he says, hey, but you know, don't worry, God's going to provide. How did he know that? Why did he assume that? It's not like that's, that's written anywhere. And maybe God was kind of like, hey, take your son. And we don't really see that. We see a very much so of like, just do it and don't worry about it. And, you know, I think Abraham really knew it. this is a child of promise. I already messed up a few times. I tried it with, you know, Ishmael. That wasn't the father's plan. So I'm going to let this happen. and I'm going to let this play out because I know what it looks like when it does. I know whenever I followed the Father wholly and perfectly, things have been awesome. And I've literally been able to lead like armies and take over kings and all the land. How about I keep doing that? How about this is a, a method and a, and a lifestyle that's proving to be not only worth my time, but it's getting me in connection with the one true Father, the one true Creator. And you know I, that's the challenge to me. It's like, how, how can we spend that time with the father. How can we understand that it's not about just what the gifts and the good and the positive. It's just about that relationship and knowing he's in control of all of it. Let me just be part of the story. Abraham was willing and able to be part of the story. 
And guess what? He's a part of the story. Are we all trying to be a part of the story? Right. Absolutely. Yeah, you see the with the story here, you don't see him trying to bargain anything or trying to bargain for his son or try to say, well, God, what if we do this? What if we do that? You know, when Lot was um, in Saddam and Gomorrah, he was bargaining, bartering with the father. He was like, hey, if there's X amount of, you know, all the way down to if there's 10, you know, will you spare the city for 10 righteous people? And, and so through that bartering process, he saved Lot and ultimately only his two daughters. Uh, out of all of his family but here this is this is it even says here this is my beloved your beloved son you know and so you don't see abraham going well if i how about if i do this or do that now in verse seven we do have where he says elohim will provide for himself a sheep for a burnt offering my son mm -hmm. so he was still walking in faith that and even if even if he doesn't we we, we know the rest of the story <laughs> You know, spoiler alert, he doesn't kill his son. <laughs> but, um, but you know, I believe that Abraham was faithful all the way to that moment when he was raising up that. And we're, we're getting ready to go to that part in the story where he raised the knife to his son. But we don't see him trying to talk his way out of it or anything else. Matter of fact, it says he rose early in the morning. He's like, okay, Father, this is what you want me to do. He didn't like go, maybe if I wait a little bit longer and if I make my breakfast <laughs> a little bit longer, and maybe we stretch this into lunchtime. And maybe by the time, you know, the evening rolls around, God might go, you know, uh, just forget about it. You know, don't worry about any of that. But it says yeah. he rose early in the morning, which meant he was going with a purpose. Mm -hmm. I'm going to promise you, I don't rise up early in the morning <laughs> unless I got a purpose, man. <laughs> uh, my morning rolls out a little bit later every day sometimes. But if I got a purpose, you get up and you start your day. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the other things we see here is when it says, and God said to him in verse one, and he said, behold, here I am I. So it's Abraham's just acknowledging, hey, I heard you talking to me. Here, here am I. I'm, I'm right here. And then later, the son's talking to him, and he says, Father. And he said, mm -hmm. here, here am I. So he's replying in a very similar form and fashion, which is kind of interesting. I always kind of like to see that what's really behind the behind the behind the scene. You know, Abraham's a, a person of character, and, a, and, a, and he's showing this model, how I speak to the my son I speak to the father. It's always going to be out of respect. He's not treating his son like just some secondary afterthought. You know, like what? What do you want, kid? You know, he's like, hey man, here am I. What's up? You know, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to give you the respect that you deserve, and knowing that that's a child of promise, and knowing where that promise come from from the father. And you see, there's this kind of interesting relationship that you start to build with Abraham and Isaac. There's this like fun, but weird. But Isaac's kind of like. I hear what you're saying, but I don't understand what you're doing. And one of the things that I, I picked out in here was if you look in verse seven, God will provide for himself a sheep for a burnt offering, my son. So he's speaking to his son here and he's saying not only will he provide a sheep for burnt offering, that means that process of burnt offerings, sacrifice, that was already built in and established. Abraham's not building some new theology, some new process that hasn't existed before. And this is clearly before the time of Moses and Mount Sinai. There is a burnt offering. There is a sheep that we know that's part of that process. And Abraham's already doing it and understanding it to an extent that he shouldn't know if we're only following the law of Moses. Clearly, Abraham is doing what the fathers asked him to do, prescribed well before that time frame. And not only that, but he's saying God will provide. So one, he's saying this isn't about me. This isn't about you, but God's going to be the one to, to provide. He's going to follow his rules and regulations as stated from day one in creation. But it's for a burnt offering. And he's telling this to his son. He's saying no humans are accepted as a burnt offering. So I don't even have to worry about that. I think there's this huge, huge theological like process in Abraham's brain where he's like, I'm so smart in this category. I'm so reliant on what the father has shown me. I'm so aware of how this process works. And it's one way, one answer and one truth. There's nothing else that can even be here. So I'm not going to twist it. I'm not going to pervert it. And I'm not going to try to adjust it. All I know is he said, sheep are in lambs and goats are for burnt offerings, not humans. So if I take you here and that's what he's asking for, there must be something else. And I don't understand it, but he understands it, and I'm just going to walk it out. Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up. Perfect, man. Amen. Okay, so we're also going to notice some additional uh, things in here, and I want to start making sure that I point these out in future uh, chapter studies. Um, so y'all help me remember to do this, but uh, anytime we have a discrepancy between what the Masoretic text is saying with uh, between the, the Masoretic and Jubilees, 
we also want to check and see what the Septuagint says uh, or, or, or any other uh, historical scriptures that we have. Um, so over here on the uh, on the left hand side, it says that the the lexicon says this same thing right here where it says on one of the mountains um, in verse two uh, and offer him on one of the mountains, which I will point out unto thee. In other words, you just go to the mountains. I'm going to point out the place to go to. But in the in the NIT, it says the land of Moriah. And let me back that up. That's the uh, that's actually the NL. T. That's a that's a typo there where it, it has the um, the the I or what appears to be an I. That's actually a lowercase L supposed to. So that's just a little typo there. But that's the New Living Translation that says the land of Moriah. And uh, I did thought it. <laughs> I did think it was pretty funny down here um, in verse four. Clearly, these were Southerners because we have uh, yonder mm -hmm. <laughs> listed here. You know. <laughs> The lad shall go yonder. Was it south of Jerusalem, right? So it can, they can still be considered Southerners? Hey, there you go. <laughs> Last thing I wanted to point out um, as far as the translation versions and things like that is in verse 7. Uh, it says, and he drew near uh, to the place of the Mount of God. Instead of the words, the Mount of God, the Masoretic text uh, in Genesis 22, 9 reads, which God hath told him of. So, so we're missing the the mountain part of that. And it's giving it kind of like it could be anywhere at any re for any reason, but here it's saying at a mountain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yep. So this is a specific place. Okay. All right. And I have a question in verse five that I thought was interesting. It stood out to me a little bit here because what you know through these studies we're understanding that Abraham is walking um, as a high priest. He's doing things now since a few chapters back where his eyes have been opened to the ways of the father. And in here I see it, and it says in five, and he took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand, the fire and the knife. For some reason, I've never, I don't know if that's in, in the account of Genesis or not, but he actually bringing fire with him, not just the wood, but he says and they, in, and in his hand, because he, he gave his son the wood, and within Abraham's hand, I'm, I'm, you know, he he brought fire with him. So I thought that was kind of interesting because that would be a part of the ceremonial part of that is, is to have fire, right? Yeah, uh, ceremonial. So, so Joe, to back that up with what you're saying, it's in Genesis uh, 22, verse 6. It says, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they both went together. So, yeah, I think it's just one of the things we might have overlooked Uh Especially yeah. when we're not when we're not looking at it from a priestly kingdom mindset, where it's exactly. actually trying yep. to show what's happening. Because guess what? Last time we hear somebody doing something crazy with some fire in the temple, they didn't have a good time. You know, they brought strange <laughs> fire, and it, it didn't work out for them. So it's interesting because you brought that up with the fire. There's something very specific, and maybe Abraham's still taking this fire, this quoted fire, from a continually burning fire that's uh, meant to yeah. be and purposeful for temple practice, even yeah. though there's not a temple, even though it's not a tabernacle. So I think you, you bringing that up actually solidifies the point in Genesis 22, six, and even further makes this point solid in chapter verse five that we were going through. Absolutely. That, that was a point I was getting to that. I felt like this fire he was drawing from just wasn't any, nor it wasn't like the campfire. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. You got, you got some ashes left over, bro. Yeah. Bring it over here. <laughs> Yeah, this wasn't brought just because it would make it easier. He doesn't have to start a new fire when he gets up there. You know, no, this is... This was a holy fire. Right. Mm. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. If we could all be smart like Joe. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Good catch, dude. Good catch. All right, guys, let's get uh, back to it in verse 8. And it says, and he built an altar and he placed the wood on the altar and bound Isaac, his son, and placed him on the wood which was upon the altar and stretched forth his hand to take the knife and to slay Isaac, his son. And I stood before him and before the prince of the Mestima and Yahuwah said, bid him not to lay his hand on the lad, nor do anything to him. For I have shown that he feareth Yahuwah. I called to him from heaven and said unto him, Abraham, Abraham. And he was terrified and said, Behold, here I am. And I said unto him, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything to him, for I have shown that thou fearest Yahuwah, and hast not withheld thy son, 
thy firstborn son from me. And the prince of the, the and the prince of the Mastema was put to the shame. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a single ram was caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Mm. <laughs> good stuff. Yeah, that's getting fun. Okay, so before you guys get into the stuff that y'all uh, wanted to see here, I did want to point out also the the notes that were on the side here because I thought this was really cool. Uh, especially when we brought up earlier that this was not uh, this was not Hasatan doing this to Abraham or testing him that this was the father, but there was apparently there was a uh, a question from the enemy like that, that that this was brought forth from the enemy I guess to test Abraham and the father was doing this. Mm-hmm. Um, so in verse nine it says, and before the prince of Mastema. Uh, and in verse 12, it says the prince of the Mastema, the prince of the must of the Mastema was p- uh, put to shame. So there is a prince of this Mastema. It's not just a, a, an individual necessarily. So uh, the, the note that's over here on the right hand side says um, Mastema is the name given to the whole class of evil spirits or Satan's Hasatans elsewhere of the prince of these himself Mm -hmm. so in other words mastema can be a reference to this entire class of evil spirits but it can also be a reference specifically when it says the prince of these would be the reference to the evil one right and i'd like to kind of add into that for anybody for everyone who's listening (laughs) um that the evil spirits here are not the same as the unclean spirits so these evil spirits are that of of the class of angels (laughs) or whoever that is on that on the other side and that are up to no good, so to speak. And the unclean spirit is that of the descendants of the Nephilim, or they are actually of the descendants of the fallen angels who then became the Nephilim. Very good. So it's kind of wanted to delineate between the two. So there's not a confusion there of the evil spirits and unclean spirits. Yeah, I think in our, in our English, you know, verbiage and the way that we speak, you know, we, we say, Oh, the devil made me do it or the devil this, but then we also say, man, the, the, the devil's, you know, we also use it as plural. Um, and I think it's it's just lining up with that same concept of the bad or the bad, right? The devil or devils. Um, it, I think it's just given us a little bit of an understanding, which is good. I'm glad that we can kind of dig into that a little bit more because it does make it awkward. We're earlier we're reading Mustima as a name. We're now reading the Mustima and you're like the prince of it. Like, how are you the prince of a person? You know, it, it, it seemed like it was a little bit out of place, but I'm glad we kind of dug into that. So we, as we're reading um, in the future, we could kind of understand that, you know, it's, it's the adversary and all that work with the adversary. It, it helps us to understand this isn't just one guy running around, you know, tempting everybody and causing everybody to struggle it's it's him and everybody who follows under him because um in, in our earlier chapter um before 18 we talked about satan or mustima here propositioning god essentially how he did with uh, job and saying hey what about abraham you know let, 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 why why don't we put him to the test a little bit and it was interesting that we had that correlation and connection and it's kind of playing out that's why it says before uh before the prince of mestima because it's really saying hey you you thought this was a good idea to test abraham okay well all this is going to happen right before your eyes and you're going to see he's willing to take this to the to to the end he's willing to take this 100 percent. so you don't win you don't even win this battle even the little bit of thing that you tried to do you're not it you're, you're, you know he serves me not you i wanted to take a second and point out in verse eight over here um because we made a point to 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 point out earlier that the idea that you know that 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 Abraham could have possibly had this 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 wink wink moment right the Lord will provide mm-hmm. moment right so he's trusting that the Lord will provide and he knows that human sacrifice is not the Father's ways and all of this stuff and he knows the promise that was given to his son and all that right but let us not forget over here in verse 8 abraham came to a defining moment in his faith here where he said regardless of all these things i understand and know to be true i do know that the father told me to do this and i'm going to take this out to whatever extent i have to and I think that there was, even if it was just a brief moment, whether he knew all along that this was not going to happen up till this moment, I think there was a moment right there at the very end where he says, where in his mind he had to make a decision, choose this day whom I am going to serve. And it says, and stretched forth his hand to take the knife to slay his son. Now we have this, um, we have this idea in our head that he's, you know, 
got his hand above Isaac that he's ready to come down. Um, but it says he stretched forth his hand to take the knife. This could be as simple as him reaching to grab the knife. Mm -hmm. I think so. Right? Yep. Either way, there was a moment that happened where he was like, okay, I'm going to have to do this. Yep. Right? And either way, he decided to trust the father in whatever was done. And he grabbed the, he, he, he stretched forth his hand to take the knife to slay Isaac, his son. It doesn't say he, he took the knife because it was just the next step in the process and he knew God was going to stop him. He says, it says his hand, he stretched forth his hand to take the knife to slay Isaac, his son. He had, he had committed mm -hmm. to it. He had committed to obeying. Mm -hmm. So in that moment, uh, even if not any time before then, at least in that moment, he was committed to obeying. And the father said, all right, I got you. <laughs> yeah, and I want to back that up too with, um, I've got the, the scriptures pulled up here on my phone, uh, verse 10, and it says, and Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. You know, that's, I'm glad we're talking about this because a lot of times we already get a picture in our head, you know, of what's happening. We think he's fully extended and he's ready just to plunge straight yeah. through his son. The Hollywood version. Yeah. What's that? The Hollywood version. The Hollywood right. version, yeah. Or maybe it's the more dramatic where it's like both hands up in the air, and he's like <laughs> just, you know, ready to, to bring it in. But you know, here in the uh, in uh, the scriptures, uh, it says, "And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son." So I've never seen that before. You know, I've always thought in my mind, you know, he's ready to, to plunge it in there. And here is the saying, "Hey, he reached, he stretched out to grab the knife." Mm -hmm. Now the next motion in this would be if the angel hadn't have said hey abraham abraham you know uh stop you know we're good mm -hmm. don't do it um the story would have been different and so yeah well and i want to take this a slight askew from where you guys are at not different but just a little bit a little a little bit uh separate part of this so i think when we start in eight it says that he built an altar first of all like i said i'm really really loving learning about Abraham. Everything we're reading about Abraham is action. He's doing the thing that he understands. You know, how often are, do we understand a lot of stuff and don't do the stuff we understand? We read a verse that says, don't do this. We're like, well, what about? Or we can see something clearly written in scripture and we just overlook it. Abraham's not doing that almost ever. He says, hey, go to the mountain and do what you're supposed to do. He didn't just go up there and drop the wood on the floor and light it on fire. He went and built an altar. Sure. Building, an, building an altar means getting stones that are unhewn. So he had to go find a bunch of rocks. So this is, again, this is a process. This is him taking the time of walking this out. He's not just, all right, well, this is a rash decision. God told me to kill my son. All right, let's just get up here and make it happen. His son's just sitting there either helping him or just sitting there watching him build an entire altar. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a thing. Then mm -hmm. he places the wood on the fire. He's like, okay, that's a thing. And like you said, he then he bound his son. So this is a this slow and methodical process this isn't something that, you know, like God's asking him to make these really quick last minute decisions where like he didn't really get a chance to think about what he's doing. He fully acknowledged what the father was telling him to do. He was walking this out with time on his hands, with sweat on his brow. Man, this is hard work. I'm doing all this just to end up killing my son. Like this is this is crazy. Mm -hmm. But God god knows and i don't know so we're watching this all play out one we know there's an altar now so that again that's more of that priestly activity he's mm -hmm. putting the wood on it then he puts isaac on the wood right so it's like this whole thing has played all the way out we're, we're seeing the full fruition of what's going on but yes you guys bring in that point over him stretching forth his hand one of the things that i wanted to say there is yeah, that's a different story than the pictures we've seen than the artistic renditions of this um story it's definitely always the full this well again this is generally not how you would kill anything in a priestly action it's a clean in the animal's life or immediately quickly fully drain the blood it's not going to be this big dagger moment this killing the vampire at the end of the movie moment you know i think i think we've kind of even even that imagery has mm -hmm. been a little bit shifted because okay. it's not going to be some big ugly murder blood splatter on the wall moment right and i think our minds have just we've heard blood sacrifice and done away with and it's barbaric and it's evil and and how could god ever want that and we're, i think we're, we're kind of get this weird alter ego of god like he's like this is like god's dark side like oh he he enjoys the the blood and he enjoys all this other stuff and it's like i think we're not really seeing it for what it is and and with you guys bringing that imagery of the big dagger coming down i don't think it was about that at all even if 
he was to take it and he was more than just stretching out his hand. It wasn't stretching it out to do that. It was stretching it out to like, all right, well, now that you're laid here, I'm going to have to do this the same way that I had would have done with the sheep that I brought up here. Yep. I'm going to end its life mer with mercy. I'm going to make it as painless as possible, as quick as possible. And it's purposeful and intentful, not just, hey, let me just stab you somewhere weird in the middle of the chest or, you know, wherever. And, you know, make this big gory scene. It's it's none of that. Yep. And so that story now makes sense of why he's reached out to grab the knife, why he's playing this whole scenario out, very building an altar, bringing the wood, grabbing the knife. He's doing everything exactly how he would have if he was a priest. And he's yep. showing Isaac to be the lamb that was slain. Well, let's think logically now ahead a little bit, a couple thousand years. This is that same thing that the father is doing with his own son, reaching the knife, never killed the son. The son gave up his life willingly, just like God gave this ram. He gave up the ram willingly. It was a. It wasn't something that he had to go out of his way. It wasn't something that that son had to give up his life. The father had to take the son's life. The son's life was given, and just like how that lamb here, that ram, it was given. And that's the that's the big part of that story for me. I just loved putting all those pieces together, even right here on you with you guys here on the internet all together. Putting those pieces together has just been really fun. Absolutely, man. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up too, Jonathan. The imagery of that would have never been, I don't think, of him raising his hand up anyway. Actually, that when they when they would kill the animals, they would do it in a way that the animal was not under duress. And you know, they, you typically from what I understand, you know, of course they would cut the, the, the main arteries in the neck and they would let the blood let uh, let the blood out. And so that might have been why the angel was kind of like, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Because this wasn't even a moment of doing this. It was a moment as he reached for that knife. The next thing was to reach for his son and actually to uh, bloodlet him. So, um, which actually would have been a lot quicker procedure, I think, than the whole dramatic, you know, raising your arm <laughs> within the air and, and driving it. Because none of the priests would have done that to any of the animals anyway. They wouldn't have laid an animal up there and, like, forcibly stabbed it through the chest into its heart. <laughs> they would have, you know, let the blood out so the animal could, you know, like I said, it, it would be as peaceful of as possible for the so i'm glad you brought that up and it kind of like dispels some of the myths of what could have took place there with his son and i like to also bring up too isaac let's don't forget isaac's in this story guys that's um, exactly where i was about to go i saw your it. highlighted part there i was like i'm gonna let you steal my thunder <laughs> <laughs> um you gotta stop fighting over there let me you know what i the way i see this Let's look at the comparisons of Lot and Abraham because Lot, his whole family pretty much was 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 lost except for the two daughters. And then bad stuff happened after that with the daughters. Mm -hmm. But you see that the family didn't even trust Lot enough when he was telling them, hey, God, you know, these angels are here to say, we're getting ready to be destroyed. We need to leave. And they're kind of like, yeah, whatever. They didn't, they didn't take Lot seriously. But what we see with Abraham is who he, his son seeing his dad for who he is. His words always match his actions. Mm -hmm. And so what I love about uh, Isaac here is he's like, hey, son, we're going to do a sacrifice. Okay, father. And all the way there, he's like, hey, father, where's where's the ring? He says, don't worry, God's going to provide. And, and right after that, it says he's the one that's being bound. Mm-hmm. He's the one being placed on the wood. I don't think Abraham had to knock him out or to wrestle him on the dirt to do this. Isaac was willing to go through with this because as his dad said so, or his dad was leading him in this. So we got to give Isaac some props here that he was willing to go do this himself as well. Yeah, that's exactly where I was going to go with that. It does say that he bound him. And, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's, I guess, implications there. There's a possibility that he was bound so that he couldn't fight him off or whatever. And we yeah. do, have, we do have that, uh, that thought, line of thought come up sometimes, uh, but but I don't think that's the case. I, I really don't. We have no mention in scripture um, whatsoever that says that there was a struggle, that there was a fight between them, that there was you know any of that kind of stuff, right? It just says that he was bound, and then it says that he placed him on the wood. You know, this definitely mm -hmm. was not a violent situation happening here. No, um, he was placed, right? So anyway, thanks for bringing that up. Um, I think that, and I'm not hundred percent sure guys, but I think that might've been how, uh, they did it with the actual lambs. They would bind them. And, and I, and I can see why they would do that because if you got an animal that you're getting ready to cut his throat or, you know, to do all the things that you do for the sacrifice, the last thing you need it doing is moving around and making this a lot more difficult. Right. So I don't, I don't really think that Isaac, they, they were having a, a WWE moment here or anything <laughs> like that. Um, I think Isaac was like, Hey, and Isaac watching his father would already know this is the proper way to do this. Mm -hmm. So 
hey, he, he knows that the father's going to bind him as they would a lamb. And so I, that's why I, that's why I'm giving props to Isaac right now is, you know, he could have just literally took off running back to home. <laughs> you crazy old man. I ain't doing this. I'm out of here. Yeah. But I think a lot of it has to do with who Abraham was and the, the way that he walked with the father and his son being able to see that. So, you know what, dad, this doesn't make sense at all but I'm going to trust you because I trust the God that you serve. Amen. Yeah. And I think that that lends to Isaac. It's showing a bit of Isaac's faith walk where he's now assumed the role as, you know, I'm going to be the future patriarch. I'm going Mm -hmm. to start to follow what my father's doing because he's watching the blessings. He's watching all these things play out in real life. And, so he, he, you know, it's different. You see some of the sons in different biblical stories where the son's kind of like, eh, whatever. You know, that's that's what dad does. I'm not really going to do that. Yeah. But here you're saying, you know, hey, that I, can, I, I see it. And not only that, but I acknowledge it. And I want to be a part of the rest of this story. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that I'm doing what I need to do, that each part of this is going to continue to follow the father's will. And I, and I love that that you brought that up, Joe, because Ab- Abraham and Isaac have a, that special relationship. They have a understanding of hey god speaks to me isaac and i know that's weird and i know it doesn't make sense because the pagans talk about that but this is real and every time god has told me to do something i've done it and it's been awesome that's how you got here in the first place i was old you can see me now i'm old so (laughs) yeah i mean i have to do it and isaac's like that makes sense so far i mean it's 10 for 10 why why would we change the process now and that's a weird thought process in our world today because i don't think god if he's speaking to us that way that we're not walking in that same path we're not doing those same things we're not having we're not faced with these same challenges of go to that mountain build an altar bring your son you know, no one none of us are being called to do that none of i mean that we that i know of at least and if we were i mean i hope that we'd pass that test but you're seeing abraham actually pass the test he's part of the history of passing right. the test not the you know another failure story like we're going to get to you know when you start reading through the kings and the judges and stuff you're like and so and so came in and they failed and mm-hmm. failed and failed and failed but one of the things i actually wanted to talk about is if we can pull up verse 10 it says and i called to him from heaven and said to him abraham abraham and he was terrified and said behold here i am right so we're kind of getting that same language again abraham seems to be mr steady and reliable here i am here i am a hey, father calls me here i am the son calls me here i am but what i thought was really cool and maybe i didn't want it to get uh missed or overlooked was it's talking about the father he says i called to him from heaven so all these stories all these examples the father's still on the throne mm-hmm. the father's still sovereign he said from heaven i will talk to you I, I, you don't get to come here on my level and I'm not going to come down there on your level. I'm talking to you from heaven. I think that's a really interesting concept to show that Abraham's understanding a little bit. It's not like Abraham heard this random voice or however they were, he was speaking to him. It was like, who's this? I don't know who that is. One, it says, you, you know, know my voice, be, be ready to hear from me. Abraham was willing to hear from me. He knew his voice, but I also think it's cool. I, I don't remember reading too many times where God from heaven is speaking to somebody to earth. You know, that's a very interesting concept. It doesn't, and at least here, you know, this book was written by Moses through the um, words of the angel of the presence. So when the angel of the presence speaking says, we told so-and-so, we did such and such, or I did such and such, but here it's saying the Lord from heaven. Yeah, and so whenever I'm, whenever I'm saying that Abraham's hearing the voice of the Lord. It's not the audible, booming voice that maybe we think of, you know, that voice that we hear from different movies and fun kind of, th- you know, guys that are trying to do that deep voice that's, I am the voice of the Lord. It, yeah. This is more of the, these are the words the Lord is speaking. These are things that we should recognize, and they're going to match up with Scripture. They're going to match up with prior revelation. They're going to match up with even the different experiences Abraham thus far has gone through. So really what I was kind of getting at there is that it's saying that as Abraham's hearing the voice, as he's getting this direct message from the Lord, it's he's hearing it through still the angel of the presence as that that uh, information is being passed on. And he's hearing it in, in the sense that he understands that these words being spoken to me, these I, thoughts, ideas, concepts, these are words that God would be telling me. Obviously, he's not speaking to him in his head, but he's speaking to him through that still that angel that's been speaking this whole time. Yeah, and Jonathan, when we look in uh, verse 9 there, it says, And I stood before him, before the prince of the Mestima. So we know that the angel of presence is actually, he's in the heavenly realm. He's got Mestima mm-hmm. on one side. He's got <laughs> uh, the father on the other side. He's kind of like the middle guy here. <laughs> and so I agree with you that, um, you know, the the uh, angel of presence is the one the father speaks to the angel of presence. Hey, by the way, 
tell him to stop, you know, no more, you know, let's, let's shut this thing down, get the message to him as quickly as possible. And so in 10, where it says, and when he says his name says unto him, Abraham, Abraham, I wish there was an exclamation point there. I think <laughs> the angel of presence was like, oh, we got to hurry up and do this. Like now, like, you know, right. And I think the way that the angel must have blasted his voice towards Abraham, because then it says, and he was terrified. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, whoa. Uh, well, think about it. You, you're having this solemn moment with your son where this is about good to happen. Point. Yeah. And you're you're in your feels, you're in your emotions, you're I mean, can you imagine what's racing through Abraham's head? And if you've ever had anybody come up behind you at any point, let's say you're reading a book and you're really into that book, and so it's like, hey Joe, whoa, 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 you know, it's like <laughs> so you got Abraham here who's completely into what he's up, he's he is committed 100 percent but all of a sudden to hear this voice blast at him. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure it wasn't like, Hey Abraham, hey guy, oh, by the way, don't do that. It was kind of like it was one of those. Abraham, Abraham. He's like, oh, you know, kind of shook him out of the moment. Mm, you know, he, yeah. said, and he says, Abraham was terrified and said, behold, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's funny, too, as you kind of explain that. I didn't even really ever consider Abraham's. I mean, obviously, he has feelings. He's yeah, in the moment. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I don't even I'd never even thought that he's giving him like his last words. He's like, hey, this is our last moments together. This is the last time I might ever speak to you. You know, I, I'm sure he's willing to walk this out. Maybe. He's assuming God's going to bring him back to life. I don't know what Abraham's thinking, but yeah, you never consider that slow, um, very intense, intense moment where he's like, hey, I'm going to have to actually walk this out. I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to tell my son how much I love him, you know, that I want to give him a hug one more time. Tell him that I'm proud of him. Thank you for, you know, honoring the father that we both serve. And, you know, all these kind of like sweet, but yet mournful moments. And then, yeah, this rushing voice out of nowhere that's all loud and booming. You know, you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was just, <laughs> I was ready to have to have this quiet moment to myself. And now it's, it's, it's all on. <laughs> Can you imagine the relief that Abraham must have had, though? Well, it was kind of like he was shaking out of that moment. Mm-hmm. But it was almost like, oh, thank you. Thank you, Abba. Thank you. I knew you would come through. I didn't know how, but thank you so much for coming through for us. Yeah. He looked up to heaven. It was like, I wasn't crying. No, I wasn't crying. I was going to do it. I was going to do it. <laughs> and I think it's interesting also to point out that, that the angel didn't come down to him, didn't have to battle any, you know, uh, any other angels to get there. Like this was as if it were from the father himself, even though yeah. it was going through this, the, the angel of the presence, it was so powerful. There was nothing standing in the way. This was a direct message, mm. right? This was mm. straight through. No, no waiting. Didn't have to, you know, nothing, nothing was interfering with this message getting where it had to go right then. Yep. Well, and actually that's cool too, because this is a different experience that Abraham's having before the, what the three angels walked up to him and kind of talked to him like a human, you know, yeah. like the, uh, all these experiences are like, Hey, he's just sitting there looking at the stars. And all of a sudden it's like, don't do that. He's like, Oh, okay. You know, it's just, these like re- regular, almost like one-on-one moments with like another person, like as, as he's just walking down the road with the brother. And then this is like, it seems to be so far the first time it's like a message from literal heaven is pierced through the veil pierced right. through the firmament and got all the way to abraham no wonder he was startled he's like this isn't normal oh, i got dude. god's talked to me a bunch of times this is different I, I in my mind i hear the first part when he first calls his name is probably why he says it twice when he first calls abraham's name it was it was probably almost like a clap of thunder mm, that, yeah. that probably like you know what i mean it was almost like it was probably that boom you know it was probably mm. a abraham and then a abraham Abraham, by the way, I, I startled you. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, bro. But how to get your attention because she was about to, you know, so. <laughs> so, I, so I guess where I'm going with this is that one, that, that direct speaking, right? That direct connection with the father, that closeness. You're so close to the father. You're so, you're so in submission to the almighty that you get to hear the voice that clearly where he went, he himself, Abraham himself went through stages, just like you mentioned, where Prior to that, you had the the, the messengers. It took a little time to kind of warm up and realize who these people were and da 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 da. Right? This was a direct, and we mm-hmm. desire. We I think most of us desire to hear from the Father. We desire to hear directly from the Father, if possible. Are we really willing to submit that much? Are we willing to go to 
any extent. Are we trusting that? Are we trusting his word? Are we trusting his promises? Are we obeying fully mm. so that we can hear his voice? Just a thought. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So in verse 12, something really cool that just jumped off the page to me is, and, and again, I'm, you know, reading these things through Jubilees, you know, I've read it through Genesis account and reading in Jubilees is so similar, but yet there's words that just jump off the page for whatever reason. And, it, and in 12, it says, and Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and behold a single ram. What I think is interesting there is it, he's already on a mountain. So looking up, maybe he's looking at a higher part of the mountain, but man, it really kind of throws some interesting curveballs in there of like, what was he looking up to? What was, what, what, at what angle was up? Up was up. So somewhere higher than where he was at, whether it was elevation or even possibly in the sky. <laughs> and again, I have no idea. I don't know why that thing's popping in my head. But I mean, when we look at it, it says it was caught. And then off to the side there, so Kyle, if you scroll down a touch, on the side is a question mark. It says, add in a thicket. So it, it may or may not have been there. That's why it's in parentheses. So what if it is just reads and was caught? in the air or caught you know above him by his horns and abraham went and took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering there's just some really interesting wording there and the way that it's placed in that sentence and that structure really makes you wonder if he's on mountain and then further down we're going to read in 13 where it says that is mount sion so there's there's this there's this connection there's this extra thought and there's something that's really happening that may be more than what we originally just have read of Hey, he just looked over to the right a little bit and there was a ram that just magically poofed there and it was just happened to have been stuck and he didn't hear it the whole time. The ram was just completely sedated, sitting in a bush doing nothing and this whole time. Well, I, I, something I thought of immediately, I, this has never uh, dawned on me before, but this is a great, great moment here that we can look at and see something else. So um, whether you know, let me address your part first. <laughs> so the, the the possibility that in a thicket was not really in the original uh, is is possible, right? Um, but a, a ram could be caught in the cleft of in the in in a in a cleft of a rock, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, right. you know, his foot could be caught, his horn could be caught, or whatever, right? Um, so he could be stuck somehow, yeah. some way, shape, form, or fashion. But the fact that he's looking up, uh, it says he lifted up his eyes. Now that could simply mean. He just, he went from looking down at his son to just mm -hmm. lifting his head straight level, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. But it also could mean that he literally did look up. All right. And if he did, if he lift, if he looked up, he's not at the very top of the mountain. I think that's important because all of the pagan religions, they always placed their temples and whatnot on the high places. They wanted to have their places on the tops of the mountains. And that's not always where the father placed his stuff. And when we look at the concept of, let's just say the temple mount, um, you know, I don't want to get into this deep discussion, right? Because this could go on forever. But, um, you know, there's the idea that the, I know we know that the Fortress Antonio was was up there on the Temple Mount, right? What they call the Temple Mount. But there's the uh, there's plenty of evidence showing, uh, in my opinion, that the that that the actual temple was not where they think it is. It it wasn't on the top of the Temple Mount. It was below the Temple Mount. So if that's the case, kind of in the City of David area, um, and if that's the case, mm -hmm. that would also make sense. So it doesn't necessarily have to be on top on the very top of the mountain where these uh right. where these things were done right so anyway that that was just kind of the line of thought i was going down on that that's all very cool catch all right. yeah. yeah and kind of looking back at that uh verse there when we were looking through 12 you know it's, it's just a, such an interesting idea and picture it almost seems like it's pointing forward to what we're going to read a lot in the new testament where it says behold the lamb or behold the the son of man behold it, it's a very similar mm um language very similar way of wording it and the fact that he looked up you know it's almost as if like god was giving him the full promise of a future event hey you're getting ready to sacrifice your son but when you look up here you're going to see the lamb that was slain right it says he was slain before the foundations of the earth and right could that be before as in like in front of or was it before as in time frame i know that's something that we can kind of look at that's a little bit fun but as as he's kind of reading it it really would be a awesome story and not that it has to or it doesn't have to but looking up and seeing the future image the future sacrifice of yeshua 
and that being exactly what's about to happen right in front of him, it, he's getting the full fulfillment of what's actually happening in the whole picture, right? Abraham's a part of the small picture. Yeshua and his sacrifice is part of the big picture. And just an interesting, really cool idea and concept of him looking up and possibly seeing like a future event, almost like Moses being able to see the full land, even though he never made it into the land, kind of in that same mentality, same thought process. Mm. And even, even the concept of the substitution, that it was the lamb that was offered, the lamb that was actually sacrificed as a substitute for anything that we would have had to do and any payment we'd have to make on our own accord and by our own hands, by our own means and our own actions, the lamb was given and it was given freely and provided by the father. So it's still showing that substitution um, concept that we'll, we'll, we'll watch play out through the new Testament as well. You know, one of the things too, guys, I like to look at is in 12 and it says, and the prince of Mastema was put to shame. Mm. What do you guys think that that means exactly that he was put to shame? Was it that a fact that he came before the father and was like, Hey, by the way, I see your boy Abraham over there. And, uh, I bet you that I can get him to mess up. I bet you that he doesn't love you with all his heart and all his soul and all his might. I bet you that he will not sacrifice his son. You know, I wonder this, this, the, we don't, we don't completely get that entire conversation there, but I, but can you imagine that the, whoever this is, this Hasatan, this Mastima person, can you imagine him standing there? Because here's the deal. They're both there with the angel of presence. And it seems like he's kind of in the middle. He's the middle guy again. And they're getting a full view and how that's being done, how God's doing this happening. Does he have the satellites? He's got, you know, an HD TV. <laughs> you know, he's got, you know, Abraham on, on the on the 8K, whatever that is, that they're, you know, within that heavenly realm, it's almost like everything has stopped for this moment. This very moment in the heavenlies was this important. That everything it feels it feels like everything is now focused on this one man and the destiny that God has for him and how important this was going forth for all of us because let's let's face it guys if Abraham fails this test we may not be here we mm -hmm. may not be having these conversations there may be a whole nother road that the Father took to bring about the twelve patriarchs so this is a pivotal moment in heaven and in earth right now this pivotal moment of Abraham being obedient to the father that, that just sets, sets it up for the rest of everything to come. And now you have the enemy sitting here and it's literally like he is put to shame. And I, I just, you know, not that I ever want to see the enemy's face, but I could, could just imagine the look on his face when the father looks back over him and goes, that's my boy right there. You see that? Yeah, that's my boy. And an enemy's got to go. Mm -hmm. he, he's not going to be hanging around much longer. So, I just had a thought on that, Joe. When we think about Revelation and the seventh seal being opened, mm -hmm. there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Oh, wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wonder if this is because the accuser has been put to shame um, yep. and he can no longer accuse. Mm. Ooh. I that like That'll like eat. You. That'll eat right there. All right, we'll, <laughs> we'll have to come back to that. Oh yeah. So with that, guys, we will see you next time for part two of chapter eighteen in the book of Jubilees. God bless. Shalom. Shalom. Mm. I got the final word. <laughs> <laughs>